Hello, everyone. We're going to give it about two minutes. So, two more minutes. You're in Gaia. While you're getting settled, we could really use a volunteer to take some notes. You don't have to capture every single word, but uh, if you could capture the Q&A, that would be very helpful. Just raise your hand if you feel that's something you'd like to do. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Gaia. We have an interesting experiment on today with most of our um, participants providing presentations remotely. So we're going to give it a go and see how it works. Um, the agenda does have Lakshmi going first, but we don't see him yet in the room. So we're going to start with Adasorn in a sec. I've got to do a little housekeeping. So there are blue sheets circulating in the room. Please sign in. Um, if anyone's willing to help us take notes, as Matt's just asked, do we have someone raise their hand to help us? Maybe. <laughs> Addison will help. Thank you. Yeah, mostly the Q&A. We'll help you capture, capture that. Thank you. Pardon? Yeah, there's a Java room open. And my name is Jane Coffin. I'm one of the co-chairs. Um, my other co-chair is Leandro Navarro, and Leandro's in Spain right now. Matt Ford, who's sitting next to me from the Internet Society, used to also be a co-chair of Gaia, so Matt's giving me a hand today. So we're going to get started quickly with the um, just quick note well. Oops. Most of you know the IRTF IPR policy, but we just want to make sure you have the opportunity. Sorry, this is a little bulky. Uh, the opportunity to see what that is. And it's online as well. So there it is. And here's our agenda and time plan. So given that we don't see Lakshmi, I just want to think we're going to ask you to go first. And do note that we are working on a mashup of uh, a draft on different um, connectivity models. And we'll be talking to you about that toward the end of the session. So, Adesori, one sec. Okay, while we're waiting, so um, should we introduce myself? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adesori, Anders in Saptavi. So, I'm from I'm a senior research associate at Interlab, Asian Institute of Technology. So uh, today I will give you kind of the update of what we are doing here with the, with the project called TACnet, which is a community network that uh, try to provide the connectivity to the rural area of Thailand. Uh, 
and this is a list of my uh, my co-authors that we're working together with Nisalat uh, Nantapat and uh, Bipun, our PhD student, Dr. Atapong, is our uh, faculty member from AIT, and Professor Kanchana Kanchanasud. Uh, okay, all right. Uh, actually, uh, I might give you a brief introduction here because actually in the previous ITF, in ITF 102, I already present about the darknet already. Uh, today, uh, this is kind of the, uh, but, uh, the slides not uh, quite fit into the screen, I think. So uh, this is what I'm talking about. So the darknet is uh, uh, the research project that try to use utilizing the wireless mesh network to provide internet connectivity in the northern part of Thailand called Mesot District or in Ta Province, which is a border between uh, Thailand and Burma. Uh, we started this project since 2013. It's about been about six years already. And we have already deployed uh, um, about 17 remote villages already so, since then. And more than 200 routers know that we have already deployed in those areas. And currently, um, more than 1,000 users using our network on a day to day basis. And this is some kind of the, the statistic that we have. So from 2013 to uh, 2016, uh, the target is run based on the volunteer. So we have the student and a volunteer from the lo uh, local people helping us for the deployments and maintenance the network. So we could not go so far. We have we can deploy almost about one village per year. So since recently in 2017, we shift uh, we change the business model with the help from the THNIC Foundation. Uh, and we call that the new business model called Darknet 2. So uh, the details of the, uh, the models I already mentioned, uh, we already have documented and then going to be published in GIS Watch 2018. We're going to be uh, released next uh, next week. So uh, from then, uh, we could be able to deploy uh, the network. Like, uh, for, for example, from last year, we can deploy almost six relays one year. And this year, we uh, released about seven relays already. OK, so uh, in terms of technology, actually, Darknet, we uh, is the extension of the our old project called Dumbo, which is about to uh, using the wireless mesh network to uh, to support the post disaster scenario. So in Dumbo, uh, we use the uh, OS routing protocol to create a wireless mesh, and that is the, uh, the, the the project that we have. And then we try to extend uh, to use in the community network context. You can see that from the equipment that we use is most of them are from the off the shelf equipment like the TP links. Uh, uh, I could mention that the small one that I'm showing on, on the right hand side, that, uh, on the, the light one, which is quite portable. So because the purpose of that, because we, uh, the, the, the villager can benefit from that. But when the yeah, kind of disaster happening, like a earthquake or flooding, the people, uh, the villager can took out the router and then uh, they can create the wireless mesh uh, immediately without any preparation or configuration. And that's the purpose of that. And we are also using another equipment as well to provide a better coverage area, like this one, the back one, and the white one, and so on. And of course, we use a Raspberry Pi to run uh, our own local services inside the networks as well. Uh, Tarnet is running so far for almost six years, but uh, now since the network is scaling and we still have uh, many issues, and one of them is like uh, we want to expand the network, right? So as you can see from the map, the the yellow rectangles showing our coverage area of the village that we, we went, but we want to deploy extend the network to the, uh, the the red circle, but we could not do that. We try many solution with the Wi-Fi long range, and also the multi hop communications as well. As you can see, this is the the real location on that village. We have it in the hill tie surrounding by the mountains, and we have a lot of high tree. So uh, this is a complete non lav site. So. So we're looking around what could be the, the next solution for us to solve this kind of issue. And then we found that TY space would be a, a good option for us. So the TY space basically is a TV channel, TV spectrum, that we know that this is a low frequency band, 400 uh, VHF, USF, We should have a very really good uh, in terms of radio characteristic. So it could support a non lob size situation. And we can have the long distance propagation, uh, long distance uh, communication, 10 to 20 kilometers. And also now today, there are so many standardization available in the market and many vendors and many uh, production 
propose to use that one. And basically, uh, most of the standardization also support or two point communications as well. So, but for the TY space, to use them, we can use them only if the spectrum is not used, not being used by the primary user or the licensed user. In our case, it's a TV broadcasting. So basically, we have to identify that what kind of spectrum that we can use. And that one is showing the white space, and this one is uh, Occupy Channels. So to, uh, to do that, we get the general support from the NBTC, which is our Thai regulators, uh, by funding us for the project, for the research project called TY Space. The project is running from 2020 and up to uh, early next year, 2019. So uh, the purpose of the project is try to do kind of exploring the benefit of the TY Space. So we we hold right currently we hold a license from the whole band for the TV channel 470 to 790, and so uh, this is going to be the first TV space trial in Thailand as well. Uh, and apart from that, we need to carry out a lot of measurement to identify what kind of white space in the rural area. This is the main purpose of the project. So to start with. Uh, to start a project, so we first have to do a lot of measurement to identify the uh, the the, uh, the spectrum white space, and those is our equipment that we use at the moment. So we use a low cost spectrum analyzer called IVX Polar. The benefit of that because it's cheap, we can buy a lot of them, and then we can give them to many volunteer like student to run the measurement in their home and in their house. And we are also using the uh, the small equipment like a laptop or or a Raspberry Pi. And we also get help from IC ICDP uh, in Tester Italy. This is our partner to develop the software to recording uh, the spectrum measurement from the average recorder and then uh, record them in digital format in, in the last reply. And here, this is our uh, configuration for the measurement. So we are scanning the whole band from the TV channel in Thailand, 510 to 790. And the signal bandwidth is about 10 megahertz and bandwidth resolution. Yeah, so uh, in terms of location, we are considering interesting in two different locations, like uh, inside the building, indoor and outside the building, outdoors, and we're also considering the height of antennas as well, like at the ground levels or at the rooftop, like 15 meters, 10 meters, and so on. So what's the problem? So now we have a bunch of data. So the, the next thing that we have to do, identify what kind of TY space. So the, the common method used in the literature, mostly uh, we are using the fixed threshold, where we set up the threshold uh, for, to, to identify the, the signal. For example, uh, if the, the signal is over larger than the threshold, we consider this is the, the, the channel is being used. Uh, FCC recommended the 100 minus 114 this is the recommended threshold from the, uh, from the FCC, but uh, uh, in the literature, people say that this is quite conservative threshold, and then people prefer to use the 100. This is kind of look of some number, and then people being used that one. And we also have another uh, threshold called occupancy threshold. For example, if to uh, if the signal is not being used more than 80%, we consider that this is a white space. So what happened with this method? This is showing uh, the measurement from the same location with the same uh, with the same equipment. Uh, this is showing the channel from channel 26 to channel 60. You can see by eyes, we have both of them uh, have the same pattern. So the uh, the dark blue showing that, that spectrum is the channel is free, it's not being used. But the problem is from these two measurements, we found that uh, from with the fixed threshold method, uh, the first measurement we identified that 10, use, 10 channel is, is being used, but the second uh, the second measurement showing that 14 channel is is busy, are busy. So, so this is not quite accurate, right? Because, uh, because as we know, because uh, from from our measurement, we see that uh, some sample is like got one hundred uh, minus one hundred one, but some sample is minus ninety nine. But we consider this is free or not free. This is a problem. This is kind of dilemma. So we're looking around, and then we are uh, uh, deciding to use the adaptive control setting. Uh, we try many uh, methods like NPs or FCME and RAT. This is from uh, the old technique that used in literature, and we also propose two new techniques as well, like adding some percentage of noise to improve the uh, the uh, the performance. And 
and this is happening here. The, the horizontal line here showing the fixed threshold and the, 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 red, the red line showing adaptive threshold that we should see. As you can see, uh, uh, the adaptive is doing quite well because it's quite adapt regarding the signal that you receive. As we know, the spectrum that you can receive, they have many values in terms of noise and spectrum that uh, diversity is as well. Uh, so adaptive threshold should be better solution for that. So we uh, recently we just published uh, the work that we done here. If you're interested in, you can look into the paper. Uh, our paper just uh, published to ACM Compass early this year. So, so in terms of comparison, this is kind of the, uh, we look into the uh, the parameter uh, the parameter called uh, false alarm detection and mis a false a property of false alarm and a property of misdetection. So from the mis uh, the false alarm mean. Uh, the false alarm means the channel is free, but we decided uh, the, the, the system showing it is not free. That is false alarm. And on the white word side, it's called the misdetection. When the channel is not free, but we mentioned that it's free. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, the improvement is, in, is doing quite well, like uh, in terms of the false alarm uh, with adaptive threshold, we, all, we get about 0% of the false alarm, but uh, with the misdetection, we can improve above about 60 to 70 percent compared to the fixed and the, uh, the basic uh, FCME uh, algorithms. So, uh, so we have compared the data measurement from the AT campus because in AT campus we have a good ground tool. Uh, from the uh, from the, the regulator because they have the report from the spectrum location in those islands. This is quite accurate and quite reliable. So we compare the results and we showing the benchmarking that we showing that the, the our our uh, adaptive threshold could be good to uh, to do more benchmarking to another location. So next one. So from that technique, so we prove that and then we apply. Uh, the spectrum measurement with our technique to another location, which is in darknet, and this is our, our, the, our white space that we can use. Which is you can see that the many channel is is free, and we can use them. So, uh, okay, here. So, utilizing them, as I mentioned, in darknet, we have the problem in terms of connectivity. So we have two solution for that. The first solution we're gonna use to white space for the backhauling connect uh, the village, the remote village to uh, the two-way base station that uh, deployed at the, uh, the public school. We have internet gateway over there. Uh, the, the distance between the base station to the village is rarely from uh, uh, 500 meters to up to 10 kilometers. So it should be fit to the TY space. The technology that we use, we're gonna use the standardization s 2.11af which is called super Wi-Fi as well. At the second solution, we're looking to the access layer inside the relays. So lately we have only wireless mesh, right? But we also expand using the device pad for the LTE small cell base station inside the relays as well. So go first. So we decided to choose the equipment from off the shelf equipment available in the market called Carson uh, Gen 3, and which is the support AC2 11 AF. And we just got equipment recently uh, last month, and we now try to take them up inside the campus to checking that okay, the equipment is working properly and what kind of uh, the design that we can make. So, uh, and this is the, the diagram architecture that we, uh, we set up. So we set up the pole about uh, seven, uh, seven meter high between the, the base station and the, this, and the receiver site. And uh, thumbs up. <laughs> Okay, we do quite quick over there. Okay, and uh, so the maximum distance we test, uh, I think we just made it last week, it's about one to one, uh, one point two kilometers. And this is the uh, the profile we got, like uh, we got quite pretty good receive signal power. The throughput is about 15, 10 megabit per second for uplink and downlink. Packet lot, we achieve um, uh, almost zero percent packet loss. TT is quite low. Okay. Uh, at the second solution, as I mentioned, we're also working on, in parallel, working with Microsoft Research UK as well to uh, to do the trial for the LTE using over the TY space. And this is equipment that we use and donate. Uh, this is given by the Microsoft Research UK. So that is our base station, that's antennas, SIM card, and also the, uh, at the user side, we have the MiFi, like a pocket Wi-Fi. 
So uh, this is the network configuration. We have the fab, which means the base station. The base station needs to talk to get the permission from the poll, which is the database, the, the white space database, to, to give a grant which spectrum that you can use, we can use. And we have a CTP agent connect to the uh, EPC, which is the, the, uh, the mobile call software like the MSC for the 2G. And uh, unfortunately, since this is working with Microsoft, right, and then the cloud that we use in Microsoft Cloud. And unluckily, uh, we don't have the, uh, the Microsoft Cloud in Bangkok. The closest one is gonna be uh, in Singapore and Hong Kong. So we already do the trials uh, almost two months already. So that is the base station. We put the, uh, the antenna in the base station in the IT building of the campus. Is the, 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 the high is about 12 meter. And this is the highest building that we can find in the IT in, the, in our campus. And you can see that so louding is it have a lot of high tree over there and it's completely non loud side situation. So and this is a coverage area that we can far we found that we get the coverage area about five hundred meters, which is you know, cover uh, the part of the campus already. And then we do some testings as well, like uh, we testing inside the lab in the lab in in my lab. And the distance from, from our lab to that base station is about two hundred meters, and this is kind of uh, we do just a simple uh, speed test to see that okay what kind of uh, the, the bandwidth the latency that we have and also we measure spectrum as well uh, we did two types of testing like uh, we testing uh, the server in in hong kong because at the time of for testing uh, the epc is located in hong kong choose a hong kong for the uh, for the primary epc and we do the testing compared with the bkk uh, we found out for uh, the Hong Kong server, the Hong, Hong Kong case is pretty much is, it slightly better compared to the BK because as we know, as the, the car is in Hong Kong, right? So it uh, should get the, the better performance as well. But this is quite interesting because we want to deploy the system, the, the equipment in Darknet, which is far away from Bangkok. So we might get the problem in terms of connectivity as well because uh, uh, the EPC is in the cloud and then the cloud is outside the country. So this is, might be a, another new research dimension that we are, we are focusing with as well. So the uh, so next step, actually, there are many steps. Uh, the first thing we, we, we want to deploy, the system that we have, like the TUI space back hall, and also the, the LTE small cell in the Darknet, which is the northern part of Thailand. So we plan to do that uh, maybe next month, it's early, at the earliest. And we also try to explore another method for the, uh, the, uh, for the spectrum measurements as well, because we want to uh, build by uh, introducing like kind of machine learning neural network as well to, to better build uh, the accurate data for the, the white space. And of course, we keep, we still keep expanding Darknet to, in order to get connect people as much as we can. So that's it, I think. And okay, so uh, uh, this is our team for the Darknet team. I, I have to mention that with the Professor Katana, this is the whole team that we're working together. And we will, I would like to thank uh, THNIX as well. It's, it's, our sponsor, uh, it's, it's kind of our sponsor so far since the beginning of the project. And we have NBTC uh, to give us the research grant and also the license. And we thank to ICDP uh, to helping us for the spectrum measurement and TYS1 and so on, those Cambridge and Microsoft Research UK for, uh, for collaborating in terms of LTE solution. So that's it. Thank you so much. If you have any question. Um, yeah, we've got time for a couple of questions. Does anyone have a question for Adesworn? The mics are in the middle of the room. I had a question actually. Um, if you go back to your slide where you had the kind of false positives, yep. you know, the slide I mean. It, I'm just trying to make sure I understand it correctly because it seemed like the left-hand side of the slide where you had yeah, got down one. to 0% yeah. probability of false alarm. I mean, that's great, mm -hmm. but it seems like the occasional false alarm sort of doesn't really matter very much anyway. That's true. That's Whereas on, but, but what I want to say on the right-hand side, you've got an improvement there, but you're still not never using the spectrum when it's otherwise occupied. And it seems to me that like that's, if I'm understanding it correctly, that's, that's kind of a problem. Yeah, that's correct. Actually, uh, the critical parameter could be here, uh, the misdetection, because if you misdetect it, it means you try to interfere, interfere the primary user. So far, uh, our statistic is not, it's just the, the best, uh, the best for we get about 30%, which is still quite high. 
and we keep an eye on that as well. But because we try to introduce another new technique like uh, uh, machine learning or another kind of neural networks as well, this is like we are working. I'm working with another PhD students as well to to try to improve this gap. To thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, please go up to the microphone. Oh, sorry, that previous question was Matt Ford, but I didn't say my name. <laughs> yeah, Emmanuel Bocelli in Ria. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, this nice presentation. Seems like really great work. Um, one question, like when you uh, do your detection here, like you do it in at one point only, right? Uh, sorry. When you do this, this detection. No, yeah. it's just, it's, well, yeah, for one for one location. Yeah, one location. One location. So, do you think because you're targeting like big distance, um, that it would make sense to do that and cross correlate on the, you know, both on the sender and receiver? That would make sense. Actually, or? okay, uh, yeah, actually, uh, this one, the the plot that we have here, just one particular location, but we have a bunch of them. Not only one location, we have at the receiver at the, uh, at the end size as well. Yeah, both sides. But uh, I, I was mentioned that because we choose the location inside the campus because we have a good data from the uh, from the regulator because they have quite accurate data what which spectrum is used or not, and we use them as a guide to, to compare to our measurement. Hi, Stephen Farrell. Uh, can you comment on the kind of costs and sustainability and how you might extend extend the technology to kind of more villages, or maybe this is just a research network and that's not really relevant here. But if you if, if it is relevant, I'd be interested in what you think. Oh, you mean the uh, investment, or I didn't? I didn't I yeah, I mean, so, I mean, you know, a, a typical issue with these kind of networks is that you can build them and then the project ends and the funding goes away and they, they stop. But uh, yeah, that that could be. Uh, I think for the equipment, it's not. It's not the big problem because we can give them to run and we can we have, still have the funding because we bought equipment anyway. But uh, the main problem is going to be the license because now our license is going to be end by next year and hopefully uh, we could get attention and we run to uh, do more trial to, to support those people. But uh, we try to do uh, this project as a pilot project and then try to convince our regulator, okay, this is a lot of benefit, a lot of impact that we can use the, the uh, dose spectrum for another purpose and might be uh, in, from this project, it could be, uh, it can be a, a new model that we can like a local SP run operating in the TY space to to cover, uh, provide in, uh, the low cost and that kind of thing. This is uh, our future plan. Okay, great, thanks. Thank you very much, and um, I think, thank you for the questions. I think we're gonna skip over to Lakshmi now. Yeah. Thank you, Adasorn, and Adasorn, you're here all week, is that right? Yeah, we will. Excellent. Yep. Um, so if you have questions for Adasorn, find him in the halls. Um, and one thing that he was mentioning with respect to TV white space is that there's a big regulatory push on um, for some folks in 5G. They also want some of that TV white space space. So the community networks that we work with are having a bit of a, difficult time trying to convince regulators to let them use some of the TV white space. So it's been an interesting endeavor. Lakshmi, um, you're up. Can we give you a, can we turn over to you now for Gaius Networks? Do you want, do you want to me? Yeah, if you speak up, I think we can hear you. Uh, can you hear me better now? Yeah, that sounds good. Fantastic. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, sorry, I, uh, if I got a little bit delayed uh, uh, to bootstrap the session, I was still trying to wait through the system to uh, get the exact link up. Um, so I'm very, very happy to present. Uh, so Jane, do I have my slides up? You do. Okay, awesome. Uh, how do I tell you to go to the next slide? Should I just say next slide? Absolutely. Awesome, thank you. Um, so it's a great pleasure to introduce to you all uh, Gaius Networks. This is the very first time I believe we are giving this talk. And we owe a lot of gratitude to the Gaia community for the creation of our new startup, Gaius Networks. And it's been in stealth mode, and today is the first day we are declaring it open. Um, Gaia S comes from the male version of Gaia, and we have 
a very shared vision with respect to all the goals that Gaia is trying to achieve, and we hope to work with the Gaia community to make uh, both Gaia and Gaia very successful. Slide number two. Uh, here's a brief description of the Gaia Networks team. As you can see, uh, the person in charge running the show is going to be Arjuna, uh, going to play the CEO role. And we have a collection of uh, six PhDs, uh, one finally in the making through Talal. Uh, Yasser Zaki will play the CTO role. Thomas Potch will be in charge of products. Um, Jay Chen will be the chief scientist. Yasser and Jay are faculty at NYU Abu Dhabi. I'm a professor at NYU in New York. Um, and uh, it's been about 10 years of work put together that is leading to where we are with respect to Gaius. Uh, slide number three. So what are we trying to do in Gaius, right? So if you take mobile users today, the actual user experience in developing countries is really poor, right? Due to a variety of reasons. And operators really need much better solutions, especially for ubiquitous and ultra fast access to content. And they also want a seamless user experience, even in conditions where the network environment can be challenged, right? And most importantly, they need a platform for enabling local content, right? Uh, there are many places around the world where servers are sitting in a developed country and there is very little local content generation, distribution, and consumption. And that's one of the core problems Gaius aims to fix. And if you look at mobile web in challenged environments in the next slide, slide number four, it's actually not surprising to note server latencies like two to three seconds. We have three, seen scenarios where DNS sometimes takes 15 seconds to resolve through recursive DNS queries. And you know, web pages with hundreds of objects and 30 to 40 connections can take over a minute sometimes to load. And sometimes it's not just a problem of network connectivity, it's just that the web is a mess, right? So if you want to really fix this problem, in Gaius, in the next slide, slide number five, we do two completely different things. First, we want to design a web where the content is really ultra lightweight. You know, can you design content that is 20 times smaller, 30 times smaller, 50 times smaller than the standard web page that you face today. We think JavaScript can be a curse. Can you actually design web pages with no JavaScript? And so one of the things we have done here is we have designed a new mobile app specification language and a lightweight content ad platform, which I'll talk about, which enables uh, really ultra lightweight content. The second aspect from the networking side is can we make content ubiquitous and really fast? So here we have a high performance mobile stack coupled with an edge cloud platform and a highly optimized content diffusion framework. Okay, in the next few slides, I will explain these concepts. Slide number six. So this is Gaius Networks in a nutshell, and there's a lot going on in this slide. So uh, let's focus on the left side of the picture, right? You see two buzzwords, content pro local content providers and local ad providers, right? So the core product offering of Gaius is basically a mobile edge cloud platform, right? Which sits, which can sit as close to the base station or as close to uh, a collection of base stations, like close to an S gateway, for example. And a locality is at the granularity of something like a city, right? Think about something that has half a million users, any, anywhere between 10,000 users to half a million users, right? So what we want to do is we want to have a Gaius app that people use, right? Which is basically a Gaius browser and we want to have intermixing of content from local content providers 
and local ad providers. So content is going to be viewed in the concept of channels and is going to automatically get intermixed with ads on the fly to present content as channels to the end user using a Gaius app. Now the whole platform can be replicated across multiple edges. So you would have a decentralized edge abstraction, right? And you could also have global content providers like the Googles and the Facebooks participating across individual edges, almost like in individual localities. Okay, slide number seven, expanding upon this a little bit more. So what we're trying to do is essentially create a content ad marketplace where you have content providers having small cloudlets, right? And the cloudlets essentially hosting content of a content provider, right? And when somebody clicks a particular content on a mobile phone, right, through the app, each content request is going to in essence, create an auction, a content ad auction, where the ad auction is going to run on the edge and the right ad is going to fill in into the right content. Now, unlike a traditional ad, ad exchange, here the ad exchange is controlled by the edge. And what we want to essentially look for is local ad providers. Let's say, I'm producing milk and I'm distributing milk in Rwanda, right? Do I ever even get an opportunity to advertise in any place? I, I barely get any opportunities, right? Maybe local radio. If you have a platform like this, I want to enable that milk producer to be a potential content uh, ad provider who could pay a small amount of money and yet advertise as part of local channels. Lakshmi, are you there? I think his mic went out. Yeah, is he frozen? Lakshmi, you may want to turn the video off um, to save on the bandwidth there. We might be able to get you back. A meet echo wow. issue. Uh, I think it's his end actually. Meet Echo was doing quite a good job earlier connecting okay. with folks. Um, <laughs> sorry, can you guys hear me right now? We can, thank you. Awesome. Um, so I'm, slide, I'm in slide number seven. So I talked about the content ad exchange. That's the core product offering. So it's a mobile app with a content ad exchange running on the edge. So Slide number eight, uh, I'll go through it a little bit briefly. Essentially, this, what runs on an app is this layered stack where we can take a traditional TCP TLS uh, encrypted framework and run our own congestion control called ALCC on top. And we have the specification language called MAML. And this browser can basically handle MAML content and show MAML content on a phone. So it's almost like a MAML browser, where MAML stands for Mobile App Markup Language. And ALCC is an efficient protocol that I will I'll probably very briefly get to at the very end. So slide number nine, uh, a brief description of MAML. So MAML is, is a relatively trivial concept, but it can appear a little bit complicated, OK? So think about a web page, right? Think about a web page as a rectangle or a collection of several rectangles where each rectangle is basically an object, right? So given a web page, can I basically pre-compile the whole web page such that I completely flatten out a DOM structure, right? And create a new web page which has no recursive request, no JavaScript, and each object has a very basic set of primitives, including the ability to refresh, right? So my claim is you can create a web page 
that is basically having the same look and feel as the original page without any JavaScript, but basically gives you the same look and feel and is 20 times smaller. So slide number 10. Here's an example of two such pages. So if you look at the two pages on the right, they are the pictures of uh, the, uh, the NIH web page. And in the left, you have a picture of uh, one of the news sites, right? And the left one is actually a mammal page. And if you take the NIH pages, the one in the middle is the actual NIH page. And the one on the right is the mammal page that we create. So if you do care about look and feel, we can generate at a very fine granularity a page that has the same look and feel, but the page on the right is significantly smaller. OK? Uh, now, how do people think about this? right? So we compared Mammal with Opera Mini and Chrome, and we showed that it loads much faster and its size is significantly smaller compared to even Opera Mini, right? And we compared it with different fidelity levels. So our app has the ability to change the fidelity level where Mammal low means very low fidelity and Mammal high means full fidelity level, right? So there are scenarios where Opera Mini pages in the extreme cases are actually slightly smaller when you maintain high fidelity levels, right? But Opera Mini does take much longer time to load, even if sometimes the page might appear smaller because Opera Mini has to go through recursive DNS requests and recursive uh, downloads, but Mammal is a straight uh, one shoot, uh, one shot uh, download of a web page. And the second thing is we ran a user study across hundreds of users and we showed that 80 to 90 percent of people who looked at mammal pages found that it was very similar to the very uh, to the original page while 10 to 20 percent felt it was similar very few people said it had little similarity to the original page right and going on to slide number 12 uh, talking a little bit of the content ad platform Essentially, it's as I mentioned, it's running an ad auction. And we can take different types of ads. We can take video ads, audio ads, image ads, and so on. And we can change the fidelity of the ads. And we can also have ads that can, the same ad that can be represented over an IVR call or an SMS, or the same ad that is represented as a full video ad for a particular web page. So, we specifically ask ad providers to give ads at different fidelity levels, and we can tune the type of ad that gets displayed on the fly as a function of the user bandwidth and preferences and the content provider's preferences. Okay, so ma so the ad platform is compatible across different types of uh, content. Now, to give you a very slide number fourteen, to give you a brief purview of the high performance stack. We have designed a congestion control algorithm called ALCC, which builds upon our earlier work called Verus, where we have basically been able to show that we can design a congestion control protocol for cellular, where we have a 1 by 15th reduction in delay while maintaining the same throughput as TCP cubic over a cellular link. And this has been widely tested across a lot of cellular networks. We wrote a SICOM paper about it, and then we have a follow-up paper at Usenix ATC as a short paper. And we are building upon it to make it into like a full-fledged application layer congestion control stack. So our mobile platform between the mobile app and the edge can basically run ALCC and can guarantee you very high uh, performance and with very low delay characteristics. Like a 15 times reduction in delay is a pretty big deal. And TCP cubic does a really bad job, especially in cellular networks, to bloat up buffer, right? And this actually significantly increases the user experience for audio, video, AR, VR, and other types of things, right? Uh, slide number 15, before I conclude, we also have a distributed content diffusion framework called Xcache which allows you to smartly move content to the edges in, in a sort of a decentralized manner and manage these edge caches in an interesting manner so that 
we can have live content close to the edges as uh, quickly as possible. And this distributed caching solution uh, performs better than traditional uh, caching solutions that have been proposed in the architecture. And we have compared it with legacy caching solutions and have shown between a 2x and a 5x gain uh, because of this distribution caching system. So Gaius is trying to put all these pieces together to design a really fast, lightweight web and is specifically targeting emerging markets. But the core crux of the proposition is to enable localized content and localized ads to create a sustainable ecosystem in each city to be able to run a decentralized web. With that, let me stop here and take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lakshmi. Does anyone have a question for Lakshmi about Gaius in the room? OK. We do have a question for you in the room. Is there anyone online that has a question? If you're in the Jabber room. Uh, hi, Lakshmi. I'm Addison from uh, AIT. So uh, I, I have a question about the content. So the, the memos browser is going to be applied for the all websites or not like uh, when the user turn on the memo and access to the website uh, the content will be transformed from the memos right so great question uh, let me answer that in two parts so mammal is not designed to change the full web uh, so on one side mammal is used as a standard within Gaius. Mm -hmm to enable people to create lightweight mammal pages. OK, the second part of the answer is people who really feel that they want to maintain the look and feel of a traditional web page, right? We have gone through the extra mile to say that we have, we have played around with 50 to 100 websites and we have been able to show that we can automatically convert a variety of existing web pages to have the same look and feel you using mammal and we have been able to support dynamic objects we have been able to support forms and we have been able to support uh, refreshing of content and so on so we've been able to support most of the basic primitives including audio video and so on as part of mammal and uh, it's it's mostly centered around the idea of pre-compiling a web page rather than having recursion and javascript to be so MAML does not allow very detailed analytics type of requests that some traditional web pages might have where you can move your cursor and you know you can track your cursor about certain things. So it does have certain limitations, but it's primarily designed for Gaius pages. Does that answer your question, Addison? That's great. Actually, you answered my next question because I'm going to ask about how uh, the compatibility with the the the, the local webs uh, the local con uh, the, the existing content, but I still have another question. Like, what about the copyright? Because if you're gonna, because basically you're gonna cash all of them and then lead time from. Uh, Great the, question. Great question. So, uh, as part of Gaius, when it's running as a network. Um, content providers will have the ability to choose whether they want to be part of Gaius or not, right? And content providers will have, so if some content provider doesn't want to be part of Gaius, then that content provider will not be available as a channel. I see. So in some sense, the content provider has to, you know, opt in to be part of Gaius to make that type of content visible within the Gaius ecosystem. And Gaius is primarily designed for localized content. So any user can start creating content. So you have a chicken and egg problem of how you bootstrap the system, right? So one way to bootstrap the system is to get local popular content channels to participate as part of the Gaius ecosystem. So you want to start with a city granularity where the content providers first decide, OK, I want to be part of the Gaius ecosystem to make it interesting. And then you can have people participating, creating their own channels on top, and you can have this uh, mixed ecosystem on top. All right. Yeah, that's uh, that. Yeah, you already answered my question. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Excellent. Are there any other questions for Lakshmi? Thank you, Lakshmi. This looks like a really interesting solution for a lot of uh, developing countries with low bandwidth. Thank you very much, Jane, and everyone who helped in organizing this. Super appreciate it. Um, up next is Shadi, who's with the um, Alliance for an Affordable Internet. Can you say something so we know that you're on the... Uh, can you hear me? We can. Is it any better? It is, and we do need you to make sure you don't um, touch the microphone too much, um, but otherwise you are coming in loud and clear. Okay. Can you go ahead. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Gaia community, for uh, this opportunity to A for AI, the Alliance for Affordable Internet, uh, which is hosted by the Web Foundation, but partnered by a number of uh, entities, including uh, uh, folks like uh, the Swedish government, uh, the US government, uh, uh, the UK government, and also um, our uh, host governments such as uh, Myanmar, Bangladesh, uh, Nigeria, Ghana, uh, Kenya, and so on. Um, you may have heard uh, uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee making this announcement, uh, the contract for the web yesterday at Lisbon, and uh, uh, we are we are very proud that uh, uh, our founder, uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, is uh, again uh, uh, leading uh, an initiative that uh, uh, calls for uh, a decentralized web, uh, something Lakshmi just now uh, elicited very beautifully. Um, I'm presenting this uh, uh, very brief 10-minute uh, presentation um, without a, a PowerPoint presentation as well as uh, a, a video uh, stream. Um, uh, and also I must admit here that uh, I, I, uh, my presentation is not about uh, any technological or engineering solution, uh, such as the uh, last two presentations, the TV white space one by AIT and uh, the Gaia solution for local content and local content ad uh, streaming by, by Lakshmi. Uh, whereas um, I'm going to focus more on the policy interventions that are required to make uh, uh, a, web, uh, a, a web that is uh, universally accessible uh, uh, also by the uh, 60 percent bottom percentile uh, income percentile groups uh, within within countries uh, uh, but also the regulatory measures that could be undertaken to to ensure that uh, this this could happen and in this uh, i'm going to also touch base upon uh, this the age-old solution which is the universal service access fund uh, uh, which which was introduced uh, uh, a few decades ago uh, a globally tried and tested mechanism to spur ICT investment in underserved and unserved areas. So I'm going to talk about that as well. Now, on contrary to many people who don't like to have this levy, the uh, universal service access fees, uh, which is contributed largely by the uh, telcos, mainly to, to extend coverage in rural areas where the, uh, uh, the, the market market fails, uh, many people have done their research and uh, come to a conclusion that uh, uh, universal access funds uh, don't uh, really work well. While we take note of that, uh, we suggest that this uh, uh, window of opportunity should be kept as one of the many solutions to ensure that uh, universal service is achieved uh, uh, as much for the rich also for the poor. And in this context, we also want to highlight uh, the need for uh, 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 spreading the web among uh, uh, special interest groups, particularly women, women entrepreneurs, uh, and um, uh, other uh, marginalized groups, uh, such as the disabled and uh, the elderly and so on, uh, so that uh, the web can be a web for everyone, rather than the web for uh, only the top 40 percentile income group. See, the uh, One for Two campaign, which uh, most of you may be familiar with, uh, which is run by the uh, Alliance for Affordable Internet, uh, also adopted by the Broadband Commission, talks about 1% uh, of uh, per capita income, not more than 1% of per capita income to be spent on 2GB uh, data, data access. But um, 
if you look at uh, the uh, uh, latest uh, affordability report, take for instance the Asia Pacific continent uh, has uh, actually achieved one for two target. Uh, would that mean that uh, Asia Pacific, uh, we don't have to have any local content or connectivity solutions? Uh, the answer is no, because uh, although the one for two uh, target is met, when we dig deeper and analyze the data as to who access the web, we do come to recognize that uh, the top 40 percentile income group uh, uh, only have access and uh, the uh, internet is not affordable to the bottom 60 percentile in many cases. And in the case of Myanmar, for instance, uh, a country which, uh, uh, which is uh, long ago achieved with the 4G uh, connectivity at, uh, at the fore, we still do find that people not taking advantage of uh, broadband. So that said, I want to also mention a, a, a recent report that we, we released in Africa that was in uh, uh, May this year, which uh, categorically shows that uh, uh, amongst the countries that we surveyed, 37 African countries do have a USCF setup, but uh, 62, uh, uh, only 62 percentage of these funds are active. Uh, that means uh, a, a good number of uh, countries are not utilizing this fund and un there is an unspent fund of total estimated uh, of a billion uh, available in uh, in uh, Africa, which could be spent uh, in uh, multiple uh, solutions, uh, including the solutions that uh, the two solutions that were um, uh, demonstrated just now, the uh, TV white space and the local content solution. But we also want to take note of uh, the need for spending on women, bringing women online. So the 408 million, which is unspent in Africa, we believe can be good enough to bring 6 million women online and provide the 6 million, uh, 16 million women with the digital skills, uh, um, women and girls with digital skills, and also a good mechanism for us to spend the money that has been collected sitting idle. Uh, although in many countries uh, we have seen uh, certain steps undertaken, uh, including uh, uh, countries such as uh, India, Colombia, Benin, Ghana, and so on, uh, we do see that uh, uh, there is uh, an ample opportunity for us to use utilize these funds to uh, bring uh, uh, women online. We also take note of another uh, policy opportunity, uh, which is uh, uh, increasing public access amongst uh, the underserved and un unserved communities. We, we believe that uh, the USF, USAF uh, can be utilized uh, to uh, increase uh, public access, uh, uh, not just uh, as a connectivity solution, but also as a solution to provide uh, e-government services to local content uh, uh, delivery, to uh, participation by local entrepreneurs, uh, something similar to what uh, Gaius uh, is uh, trying to do. Uh, and there are uh, a number of such experiments, and I've been a part of uh, personally an experiment called the Open Knowledge Network about 14 years ago, which was a, a local content delivery platform that we built uh, when uh, the web was in a very primitive stage using uh, world space uh, uh, radio and other technologies to uh, push and pull content. But um, many of these remained as experiments uh, until now uh, because of uh, uh, the lack of policy and uh, uh, financial support rendered to these kinds of networks that, that have come into play. So in conclusion, what I want to highlight here is uh, if the universal service access funds are spent properly uh, with the uh, right people on the board in a transparent manner with the more and more uh, multi-stakeholder involved in the administration of the fund, uh, there is an opportunity for us so that uh, the funds are not just spent in uh, very high expensive technological solutions, uh, but also to develop the ecosystem at the uh, underserved and unserved areas. And I'm also glad to note that uh, the next presenter is going to talk about the community networks. Uh, where the community take charge and control of uh, uh, their own uh, ability to exploit the web as, as a solution, particularly the rural women entrepreneurs uh, and their experiments in uh, Maharashtra in, in, uh, in India is a good case in point. 
um, you know, I can I can mention briefly about the three or four uh, um, uh, uh, good examples uh, that uh, that we have taken note of in the latest uh, report that we have re released on affordability. The, the Ghana uh, G GFEG has invested in the digital for inclusion programs, uh, which among other things uh, uh, looks at 60% uh, uh, of all uh, uh, local agents, local content agent and local uh, digital payment agents uh, as uh, women. In Benin, uh, we have uh, ABSU CEP program uh, that uh, supports uh, women, uh, rural women entrepreneurs uh, with a mobile based a mobile phone based uh, system that provides a price of uh, uh, local agriculture goods uh, some uh, such as corn millet soya bean and peanuts and so on because these are all sellers uh, who need to know the latest price so that uh, they can bargain a good deal in costa rica we, we have seen uh, good examples of women uh, actually in the uh, female headed uh, households uh, where uh, mobile access is promoted and uh, um, you know, they become uh, really uh, entrepreneurs in uh, uh, distributing services. So um, I would like to stop here by also uh, uh, highlighting Botswana and Thailand as a good practice when it comes to um, public Wi-Fi hotspots, public access internet. Uh, in India, you have uh, uh, more than 200,000 common service centers, uh, USAF, uh, utilized in uh, the, uh, expanding the broadband network uh, through the broadband uh, 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 limited uh, the state funded company in uh, Botswana we we see a number of sites uh, connected uh, through wi-fi hotspots such as hospitals bus stops taxi ranks and so on uh, so i want to utilize this opportunity to emphasize that in addition to the local connectivity content uh, technological solutions we also need to advocate for uh, policy and regulatory interventions uh, that uh, enable us to utilize uh, uh, the uh, windows of opportunities such as the the universal service obligation funds uh, uh, to to not only provide connectivity solutions but to uh, grow the ecosystem in in rural areas uh, uh, so that uh, we do not have failures of our pilots but uh, successes of our scale ups thank you Thank you, Shadi. Does anyone have any questions for Shadi? Um, this universal service fund issue is a big deal in most countries. It's quite corrupt in some, where the funds have come from the incumbents and mostly fixed and mobile operators. And the regulators have a hard time getting that money out. As Shadi is saying, in Africa alone, you've got over $400 million sitting in different regulatory accounts that could help support internet exchange points, community networks, and other. And so folks like A4AI, we're taking a small look at it, but really A4AI has done a great job on this, as has the Association for Progressive Communications, where we keep promoting with people we work with, not only in the technical <coughs> side, that you need this uh, policy-related aspect pushed. So Shadi, um, thank you very much. We appreciate it. This was um, uh, much appreciated that you did this on short notice as well. So any other questions for Shadi? If not, we're going to move over to Sharbani, who's coming from Mumbai, and she works at um, a university there. She'll briefly introduce herself. She's another partner of um, many of ours on um, connectivity, local connectivity in villages, and also a tech options that they're, they're taking a look at. So Sharbani, um, could you quickly introduce yourself, and we'll pull up your presentation. Shobani, are you ready? We're ready for you. Hello. Yes. Can you speak up, Shobani? Yes. Uh, hello, I'm Sharbani from uh, Gram Marg at, uh, at the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. And I work here as a senior pro project research scientist. Uh, in one of the IETFs, I have uh, actually presented about what Gram Marg is. Uh, working ahead uh, on the projects that we are uh, taking for rural connectivity, 
um, to the remote and unserved villages of India. Uh, we have, uh, we are now today. I'm going to present to you about um, connecting villages, the role of village administration. Uh, this is not a, this is not any technology uh, intervention, but it is a intervention for uh, policy policy measures that these remote villages uh, should be connected, and the role is of the village administration itself. Next slide. Uh, if you look at the if you look at the uh, the objectives, the objective is that uh, till now 75% of rural India is still unconnected. Um, uh, some of it doesn't even have voice connectivity, um, and the government of India is really trying hard to connect these villages uh, through the Bharat Broadband Nigam Limited, that is a BBNL, which is laying optical fiber at uh, at uh, for uh, for connecting the gram panchayats. That is the uh, that is that that is one of the locations where uh, the connectivity um, uh, goes from the uh, from the uh, uh, telephone exchanges. Um, that's where it goes. Uh, Gram Panchayat is uh, so sort of um, the head village, uh, and it has uh, three to four villages um, uh, along with it. Uh, the government also has an agenda that, if you look into the agenda of the Bharat Net, uh, is that uh, the government has an agenda only to only connect the gram panchayats, but not the villages. And that's a uh, that's a really sad part of the story. That eventually, even if the gram panchayats are connected, the villages in India can never get connected. And what is the status of these villages? Some of these villages are remote and unserved villages. And these remote and unserved villages actually do not, um, will not get connectivity for a longer duration of time. They even are not connected through private telecom operators or, or through fiber. So these, uh, the, 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 the probability that these villages will remain unconnected for a longer duration of time is even higher than even the villages that are very close by to the highway or uh, close by to the cities. The next slide. Um, so a little bit about uh, BharatNet. That is, uh, BharatNet is, uh, is a project of uh, government of India. And it is a digital plan uh, set up by the government of India to connect uh, 250,000 gram panchayats by broadband internet connectivity. Uh, the project is going very slow. Um, and uh, just the first phase of the project is over where they where they have connected uh, almost 100, 125,000 GPs, the gram panchayat, but uh, there is still a lot that needs to be connected. So it is in total to 250,000 gram panchayats that need to be connected. So there is a decision now taken by the government that uh, 125,000 remaining GPs can be connected on an optimal mix of solutions like fiber, radio, and satellite. Um, and in the as an interim measure, while the fiber is being laid, so it's like radio and satellite are the other options that the government has taken up. Uh, the agenda is that uh, uh, two, 250,000 gram panchayats uh, need to be connected before uh, the next election. Um, so it's like 2019. 2019 March is going to has been set as a cutoff date for connecting entire rural India. Uh, so next slide. So um, going with this, uh, what else we have done? Uh, we have looked into what is the current connectivity requirements uh, in rural India, and we have uh, done this that uh, um, that we have seen that less than uh, so it is it is only uh, if you look into the pie chart. We have done the calculation based on the population size of the villages and contention ratio of 1 is to 25. Um, throughput requirement of the gram panchayats can be calculated as such. And you can see that um, that uh, many of the gram panchayats, most of it is like they require less than 40, uh, 40 Mbps throughput. Um, and uh, we are taking only those villages. Uh, we we, the village administration should look into those villages where it is less than 20 Mbps bandwidth because that uh, that comes into the uh, that comes into the financial scheme of the of the village administration. I'll explain it to you a little later. So we are concentrating only on those villages that have less than 20 Mbps bandwidth uh, requirement, 
and the throughput requirement and actually these uh, these 20 these villages are completely remote villages some of these are like tribal blocks or tribal villages they it they don't even have a road to uh, travel to reach there the next slide so uh, so the architecture that is uh, that is that we have uh, that we are using here is that the the we take two options here if you look into the left hand side uh, we look into an option of telecom towers that are at a at a location of 5 kilometers uh, in the vicinity of the villages or a connected gp so as you see that uh, the government has already um, enabled uh, the first phase of uh, connecting the gram panchayats uh, so we take uh, two options one is the telecom operator star in the vicinity of 5 to 8 kilometers here i have taken as 5 kilometers and or a connected gp so a connected gp and from there take the connect they take the connectivity on 5.8 gigahertz uh, unlicensed band to the uh, to the other gram panchayats or the other villages that are not connected. Uh, next slide. So uh, there is uh, so uh, we have been working on the remote villages on these in these remote villages that even don't have any voice and uh, data connectivity. Uh, why do these remote villages need the connectivity? Uh, these villages are. Com Hi, Shabani, we may need you to reboot. Are you there? And you may want to turn off your video. Shabani? Okay, you're back, yeah? We can't hear you, so we see you around Jabber. <laughs> this is proof of uh, proof and point as to why we're doing all these projects. Can you see it? Uh, can you hear us, Sharbani? All right, we may skip to the next presentation. Arzark, are you there and ready? Okay, Sharbani, we're going to skip to Arzak for now and we'll come back to you. Sorry. Yeah. You're going to yeah. hear me now? Yes, we can. Can you um, just try and speak up a little? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so, yeah, so should I speak now? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So why do these uh, remote villages need the connectivity? Uh, these villages are completely unserved. There are there are no um, so there is a presence of telecom tower, private telecom tower, or uh, private telecom operators over there like um, uh, like uh, Reliance Geo, um, uh, Vodafone, Idea, um, Airtel, and others. But uh, they don't serve the population over there. Um, this is mainly because uh, they don't uh, because they uh, because uh, they don't get the annual revenue per user back from the uh, subscriber. Um, so what happens is that the official work, all the official work, is taken to the cyber cafe in the city, and uh, which uh, which which uh, a lot of time and money is spent uh, because uh, because they take it to the city, and they don't get a reimbursement of it. So the village administration actually spends the money out of their own pocket. So the quality of work gets affected. Now, uh, when the quality of work gets affected, uh, so some of the villagers don't even have um, uh, don't even have their I cards like the Aadhaar card, which is a which is a mandatory thing. They don't even have a voter card, and they cannot. So they themselves go to the villagers. So the e-governance services that the government has actually framed for the villagers, made for the villagers over there in these remote areas, cannot be ac accessed by them. The next slide. So, um, so why the village administration? Now, the village administration is a necessary, so um, is a very necessary partner in this model for taking the connectivity to the remote and unserved locations, and it is an integral part of seeding the growth of community network in remote uh, in these remote villages. So, the growth 
otherwise the growth of community network in these villages is not is not going to is not going to be that easy if uh, the village administration doesn't take responsibility of the network and to take responsibility of the network they really need to um, and uh, they really need to own the network so this is one of the reasons why the village administration needs to be an integral or a or a important stakeholder in this um, uh, in this approach um the also the sustainability of the network the sustainability of the network can only be managed because it, if the village administration take the responsibility because the village administration has the authority and the finance uh, they have the capability to finance for the network in these villages so uh, so we have worked on uh, worked on with them and uh, the community also when the village administration takes a responsibility the community also feels very secured and they feel that yes they should also be a part of the um, of the community of the network and uh, of course the security and longevity of the devices in these villages where the administration takes over the network is um, is for a longer duration it's long uh, i mean uh, there is there are no devices that are stolen people take care of the devices and things of that sort the next slide so how the village administration can be involved in the connectivity process so we work together with the village administration and uh, we are currently in the process of developing this and uh, developing this as a policy intervention that um, uh, connectivity is needed both by the villagers as well as the gram panchayat office the village administration um, there is a need for low height towers at the gram panchayat office the village administration uh, 15 meters less than 15 meters and use of alternate power supply such as solar panel Uh, should be employed so these are these are places where the village administration can fund for these uh, from their uh, from their fund that comes from the state uh, from the state uh, government and pay for 2 mbps bandwidth monthly from the local isp the local isp is ready to we have channelized the local isp and we have got them in touch with the village administration where they can pay for the the village administration can pay for the bandwidth uh, so the next slide so here uh, what is happening is that uh, in our villages uh, so these are some of the towers that has been set up at the at the location that is uh, at the village location at the gram panchayat location and you can see the solar panel and the and the devices that are put up on the tower the next slide Uh, this is a partnership model that uh, has been developed uh, by us we have identified the important partners and panchayat that is a village administration is an important uh, plays an important role in this partnership model and uh, the, this is the reason why uh, based on this model we have actually discussed with the village administration to start funding for the connectivity in their in their own villages so this is the public private panchayat partnership model that we have developed and this is a sustainable model on field um which has been validated on field and it is a sustainable model the next slide now uh, each of these villages that uh, each of the villages in india have a five year financial plan that they need to put it up to the village uh, to the district administration or the state administration and funds start flowing from the state administration in this we have identified that there is a flaw that there are street lights uh, putting up street lights water taps uh, road connectivity everything but there is no internet for development now internet for development if it is included in the in this financial plan most of this is a five year financial plan and uh, most of the most of the uh, connectivity can be uh, taken up by the village administration and it can be funded by the village administration and owned by the village administration uh, the next slide so internet for development needs to be included and we have worked out on a government expenditure because the government to show it to the government we really want to uh, to include so only the first year there is going to be a capex involved with the bandwidth charges for 6 months and from next year from the next year onward it is going to be very minuscule amount of opex that needs to be generated uh, that that uh, can be that the village administration needs to pay so only the first year is going to take a chunk of the money for uh, putting up the tower with solar batteries uh, solar panels and solar battery backup and uh, and based on this we can we have also worked out on a per user village cost so it is roughly around uh, 120 to 150 inr that is around 1 uh, and 
one and a half dollars, uh, roughly around one and a half dollars per user per village cost. So if um, if uh, the village wants uh, that uh, the OPEX has to be generated from the village uh, by the utilization of the services in the village, then they can charge the people uh, around uh, one and a half dollars and uh, generate the operational expenses. Uh, we are also using some of the costs can come down if we use like uh, defunctional towers that are already located in the village uh, premises, uh, the, the office, village administration office, and that way the cost can also come down uh, drastically. Uh, next slide. Now um, we have uh, we have uh, done uh, we have deployed uh, we have deployed our connectivity in uh, in 25 villages, and we have tested the sustainable model in uh, in two different parts. In 15 villages, we have uh, tested the model that uh, the connectivity reaches the village administration, and from there the local ISP uses a uh, marketing strategy by which uh, he sells the bandwidth inside the village. And we have done a cost-benefit analysis of it, and you can see that the in the cost-benefit analysis that actually uh, it is it is it is it is uh, it is um, uh, sustainable from uh, from year two. So from from year two, the and you can see the blue line that the bandwidth uh, the bandwidth increases. Just a moment. The bandwidth increases, and uh, the need for bandwidth increases. And this uh, this actually is being uh, being monitored by the by the local ISP. And the local ISP starts uh, sells the bandwidth. And as soon as the local ISP starts to earn a profit, uh, this is with the data that we already have from the field, um, uh, live data. So as soon as the sustainability, as soon as the local ISP attains sustainability, uh, the return on investment is there. There is an investment again, reinvestment again by the local ISP, and that's how. So the blue line says that the bandwidth that is required, and uh, the ROI is scaled up. In the next slide, if you can see the next slide, we have seen that how can this sustainability, we have done a predictive modeling for five years, and we see that uh, the sustainable, the, the, the model can be the return on investment is, uh, is sustainable. It keeps on increasing year after year. And as the sustainability, in, uh, as a return on investment increases, there's a steady return on investment, the bandwidth, uh, the bandwidth uh, available, uh, made available by the, uh, by the local ISP also increases so that he he makes a profit and then he makes uh, he gets in more bandwidth now if you look into year 4 almost there is stable the bandwidth is stable over there because uh, most of the users in these villages become returning users that means they are fixed users paying uh, paying uh, uh, paying a particular amount every month next slide in one of in the other model that we have looked at is the is the uh, is the VLE the village level entrepreneur so uh, a local youth in the village is nominated as an entrepreneur and then uh, the local youth uh, sells the bandwidth in the village and the and the bandwidth is uh, uh, purchased in bulk by CSE e governance india service that uh, just now shadi was talking about uh, so here you can see that um, the bulk bandwidth that is purchased is 30 Mbps of bulk bandwidth and how the ROI is, uh, so again from year two it, uh, it increases, there is a steady uh, return on investment and bandwidth increases and the bandwidth is made available accordingly. A five year predictive model in the next slide says that uh, you can see that it is how uh, the sustainability the how the model is sustainable from year two so it is actually negative uh, till year two but from year two onwards it actually catches up and uh, there is the bandwidth requirement and the availability is almost at par with each other uh, this is uh, this is what um, this is uh, this is my all about my presentation thank you thank you sharbani does anyone have any questions for sharbani Remember, some of the areas they're in are super remote, not not wealthy. And the issue of being sustainable in her predictive model is um, quite important to the deployment of infrastructure and working with the government. Thank you, Sharbani. It was so great that no one has any questions for you, but um, <laughs> an email. <laughs> and what we can do is make it available if you don't mind. Is that okay with you? Yes, yes, sure. 
You just had to ask for privacy reasons. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Thank you. And Shabani is a good uh, partner of ours in the field, and we are very keen to see how things are going with her. Thank you very much. And as you can see, we've, sun, we've done a reverse sun chaser event. <laughs> we started off in Arizona and then came back here uh, to Thailand. We've now hit India and we're up for Pakistan. So, Arzak, are you with us? Arzak. Hello. Can you hear me? You can. Hi, everyone. Can you give everyone a brief introduction of who you are, Arzak? Yeah, my name is Arzak, and I'm founder and director at Internet Policy Observatory Pakistan. Uh, we were founded in 2014 to fulfill the gap between academia, policymakers, advocacy groups, and the telco industry. Uh, we are conducting policy research on ICTs in collaboration with some of the leading institutes globally. And we are also playing an active role on issues like net neutrality in Pakistan, the recent cybercrime legislation, and increasing access, which we have taken up greatly, along with providing tactical operations during disasters. I am grateful for the Gaia community, and especially thank you, Jane, for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to present about our initiative. And this is probably the first time uh, that we will be talking about uh, this initiative uh, uh, globally. Uh, can you move on to the next slide? Uh, Internet Policy Observatory is basically a spin-off at Internet Policy Observatory based at Center for Global Communication Studies, University of Pennsylvania. Uh, we started by conducting joint policy research on the impact of ICTs in developing countries like Pakistan and more precisely what is the user response uh, on issues like net neutrality, cybercrime and recently cybersecurity. Uh, we are also working on increasing access to the internet in communities that have been unserved and remotely served by telecos. Can you move on to the next slide, please? Uh, Close the Digital Gap is one of the initiatives at the observatory where we aim to provide internet connectivity to remote communities in Pakistan. As you are well aware, that the importance of connected citizen is very important for the information society. Uh, as a tool for human development and empowerment, ICTs have no equal, and uh, this is what is the aim of our project, that is close the digital gap. Can you move on to the next slide, please? So how it started, uh, basically, uh, uh, school children in some part of Pakistan, that is Balochistan, is almost one of the remotest and least populated areas, started protesting against telecos for not uh, providing them with internet and voice communication. Because uh, we were working on mostly on policy issues surrounding the internet, we, we were alarmed by this development that the school children, you see in the pictures, were uh, chanting bagger, banners and slogan for getting computer and internet access and we decided why not give it a shot and see how we can provide them internet and computer facilities and maybe help them by contributing to becoming in the internet society and provide affordable internet. Can you move on to the next slide please? Uh, the, the pictures you see are the school children in, in various parts of the province of Balochistan demanding for internet access. Because of poverty, literacy, and lack of computer literacy, uh, access to internet remains a challenge for them. And can you move on to the next slide? Uh, this is the map of Balochistan, which is Pakistan's largest province in the northwest, bordering the areas of Afghanistan, Iran, and the Arabian Sea. Uh, it, is, it is one of the most challenging areas in the country with dispersed populations and making uh, the telecos business case a very challenging one, especially when it comes to deployment of internet, 3G, 4G solution. Can you move on to the next slide? The terrain is very challenging as well, and it's very difficult to access uh, without many highways. Uh, the security situation is volatile, especially with the local insurgency and the insurgency with the bordering 
areas of Afghanistan and Talibanization. It 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 was an extremely challenging project for the observatory, especially tackling these challenges of accesses in remote areas. And one of the other challenges that we faced during uh, this project was electricity. Can you move on to the next slide, please? As you can see, the, this is a graph we made uh, after conducting a study on the availability of electricity in most part of the province. Since most of the developing countries are faced with this dilemma of electricity shortage, we in Balochistan, where we wanted to uh, initiate this close the, develop, uh, close the Digital Gap project, also faced this issue where there was uh, no electricity for more than 20 to 22 hours. And so, as you can see in the graph, majority of the areas have very limited access to electricity, making our work more challenging and identifying these issues was a challenge. The team, after gathering these statistics, especially on uh, energy and access to telecos and the availability of internet, proposed with a solution of setting up internet kidams. Uh, can you move on to the next slide? Internet gidans are basically houses made of straw and mud, and gidan is a Baluchi word. It's a, it, Baluchi is a local language here. And uh, because we do have a lot of these gidan houses in remote areas and remote villages where people come for tea, uh, they come for to discuss their local issues, they come to access uh, issues regarding identity, citizenship, uh, and other e government services. So we decided to uh, come up with a different design. Can you move on to the next slide, please? The idea was to uh, come up with a different way of thinking and doing things. Uh, instead of going and following up the traditional way of doing things, that was to push USF for rolling out uh, fiber networks and uh, uh, punish those telecos which were unable to serve in the areas. But we were witnessing that uh, this issue was lingering on for quite a while and there was very little change in the community, especially when it came to internet access. Broadband speed was suffering and the quality of broadband access was uh, very poor as well. So it won't be a surprise if you see me going off uh, during the presentation. Uh, so our team decided to come up with a different proposal. And the next, can you move on to the next slide, please? Uh, one of the team members suggested of mounting a visa on a traditional ruksha. You might have seen a better version of this in Thailand since you all are there. Uh, uh, this was one of uh, the suggestions that we mount uh, visa antennas and move them to the remote rural areas, but given the infrastructure and road condition, the idea was rejected. The next proposal was to probably roll out. Can you move on to the next slide, please? The idea was to roll out fiber networks, but rolling out fiber networks, as we have seen, is very costly, uh, given the right to access ways and pathways and securing permission from the municipal committee. Uh, so we were uh, balancing out uh, various technologies and te uh, tools we can use for providing access to the internet. Can you move on to the next slide, please? So the value equation of connectivity was getting pretty confusing, uh, especially when it comes to remote and rural areas and providing them an opportunity to participate and interact uh, globally. Uh, the technology to be used has to be uh, robust and sustainable economically and security-wise as well. It has to be accessible since most of the population that we are dealing do not have the computer literacy in English language. So Language was one of the barriers as well. And the tools and services, uh, how we can train them on using those tools and services. And most importantly, what is community participation? It was very important for us that the community uh, that we were working for participated and interacted and created content in the local language and ensured that these networks that we were developing remain sustainable. Otherwise, we have seen that community networks where communities do not uh, participate or take ownership usually uh, die out with the passage of time. So we approached the 
local community in most of the areas where there was no internet and luckily with the help of civil administration we were able to secure buildings that were left out by various government offices seizing operation those areas uh, we started connecting with donors in pakistan who could donate us with computer equipments laptop mobile phones or any other uh, connectivity devices that we could use for setting up internet in those villages areas luckily there were few telephones that donated us uh, old and equipment that they replaced that was functional and working. Can you move on to the next slide? Please? Uh, this is one of the community halls that we are setting up. As you can see, uh, one of the team members is laying out uh, the land networks and doing electrification in the area. We planted solar panels on the rooftop of this building. Uh, so we have a consistent supply of electricity and we uh, mounted these buildings with VSAT connections. And from uh, those uh, VSAT links, we furthered our network using uh, outdoor Wi-Fi to the community networks as well. But initially, the idea was to set up the community halls and provide access and training to internet to these communities. But with the passage of time, we observed that female population, which, uh, which do have uh, limitations in traveling to public spaces in these areas, like in some part of India as well, uh, because of the strict tra traditional tribal culture and religious norms being set, they were unable to join these areas. So we decided that why do not we donate them tabs and internet devices and provide uh, outdoor Wi-Fi coverage to the villages by extending the fiber networks that would be able to provide them with internet access at their homes. And when that happened, uh, the take-up was really impressive. Can you move on to the next one, uh, This is basically a DVP reset uh, receiver that we plant along with the computer device. So whenever they have to use these devices, they can come and switch it on. Because uh, it's not operational 24-7 of the day. Uh, we keep this uh, operational from 9 in the morning till 5 in the evening, depending upon the usage. If the community is willing to use, uh, like in some other places, uh, they use it till late night as well. Can you move on to the next slide? This is an outdoor VSAT terminal that uh, we deploy at these local communities uh, to connect to the internet since we do not have any fiber networks or access to telecos. As you can see in the next slide, uh, that most telecos that were offering voice or whatever data services uh, decided to wind up their operations in these parts of the provinces and all we can see is these left out towers that are lying there without any access to voice or video services. So we tried to contact uh, the owners of these towers, maybe they could lease us these towers so we could deploy radio networks. Some of the operators were helping us, uh, they offered the use of tower free of cost while others were reluctant to give it to us even though you can see the picture. Uh, that we had to mount our own tower while there was a traditional tower available with the antenna. Can you move on to the next slide? In the past two years, we have uh, achieved a lot in terms of providing internet access. We established 26 internet kidans across remote and rural areas of Malikistan, uh, which is almost 26 different districts in the province. We also provide quarterly internet training programs at these Gidans across Balochistan where both male and female community members can participate. And most importantly, access to internet is free for all the community users. We do not charge them uh, for getting access to this connector. But what we are doing is we are uh, collecting uh, funds from donors who are funding us in, in the form of providing internet access by providing us equipment. PTCL, which is one of the largest teleco providers in the Pakistan, has very generously provided us with the internet bandwidth. And importantly, with the use of uh, outdoor Wi-Fi connected uh, to the fiber network, we have seen the increase in the effect of female interview users in these communities, which is very important. And can you move on to the next one, please? 
um, when taking up such projects, especially related to community networks, the, the challenges are immense. Uh, the lack of support from the government is one. Uh, the lack of international support as well. Recently, uh, due to the government crackdown on international NGOs, uh, getting support from international NGOs has been really problematic for us here. Uh, lack of resources. We do not have further resources. Uh, we have probably more than 150 requests for setting up more internet radars in remote and rural areas of Pakistan, but we do not have the resources in setting up these internet radars. Uh, unavailability of basic infrastructure like power is a major hurdle. Uh, we are trying to overcome that issue by installing more solar powered networks, but again, that is that comes with a cost. And security and remoteness of population. Balochistan is one of the most remotest areas in Pakistan, uh, and security has been an issue for the past decade. And lastly, the financial sustainability of running these networks. Uh, that is a very big challenge as well. Can you move on to the next slide, please? I think when it comes to community networks, uh, how it's impacting the local communities can be uh, an important factor, but how do you measure about it? Do you measure it by the speeds they get, or do you measure it by the number of people getting connected, or do you measure it by uh, uh, the way it's changing people's life? What we have seen, we have, we have conducted few remote case studies where people using our internet kidans in remote and rural areas have been uh, able to achieve shooting scholarships uh, to study in UK using those networks. Uh, they have been able to uh, set up Facebook pages to sell traditional clothes and slippers and shoes made in those areas. They are also using it for trading uh, local uh, agriculture products, which is, I think, uh, uh, very important. And for us to achieve this change meant that we had to uh, using our border metrics on time spent and direction, I think uh, the change it was making in society was uh, very important for us. Can you move on to the next slide, please? I think when uh, rolling out such products, in our experience, we have to accept the uncertainty. The uncertainty can be in the form of security, the uncertainty can be in the form of financial sustainability. And the uncertainty can be in the form of the technology used. Uh, what we adopted was uh, uh, the three-step principle, that we were flexible to the technologies being used. We were open to experimenting and learning more. And we were ready to embrace the failure as well. I think it is important that we embrace failure as well, as it's not always going to be successful, especially in such hard terrain areas and challenging environments. And can we move on to the next slide? And the next one. Thank you. Make it happen. I think with community networks, you have to make them happen and you have to have the passion to realize the importance and it can make, especially in contributing for connecting the societies to the ICT, and especially them. Thank you. Thank you, Pretty amazing place to try to provide connectivity in, in Baluchistan. Does anyone have any questions for Arzak? And Arzak, thank you for your email. If people want to contact you directly, uh, we may have some people yeah. you're in contact with from Georgia, actually, Arzak. So thank you for your presentation. Thank you so much for having me. If you have any questions, you let me know. You can always drop me an email as well. And we are happy to collaborate and share our experiences. Uh, of the project with the other members as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, and I was just curious, what what up down speeds were you getting with the resets? Uh, can you repeat that question again, please? Or what were your um, uplink downlink speeds with the resets? Uh, we, we have uh, four MB speeds with the resets. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's complicated. Very small aperture terminals, for those that may not know what a VSAT is, <laughs> used around the world, uh, and particularly in developing countries. Thank you, Erzak. We're going to skip over to Federico Capuano, who is here to talk about OpenWISP. 
So, um, Federico, you're up next, and this is Urban Wisp, a hackable network management system for the 20th century. Can you Hello. give it? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Great, great. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me to present. I will do a very fast presentation about OpenWISP. Um, it's, uh, I think this is uh, one of um, the right places to present OpenWISP because we, we have a lot of users from emerging countries which are building internet infrastructure and they need to manage this infrastructure, this, they need to monitor the system, update the configuration, and sometimes the stuff is complicated. So um, OpenWISP aims to make this easier. So next slide. Um, quick introduction about myself. Um, I'm Federico Capuano, open source software developer since many years. Started to contribute to Linux, which is a wireless community network in Italy. And from then on, I started participating uh, to different initiatives on wireless community networks um, promoted Battle Mesh, which is uh, an event for mesh networks, collaborated with Fryfunk on Google Summer of Code to develop code. Now I, I with OpenWISP, we do the Google Coding, which is a, a program aimed for students, uh, pre-university students, so very young, which we teach them how to contribute to open source. Then from 2012 to 2017, I've been working on uh, public Wi-Fi, basically. Cineca is a university consortium in Italy, and it runs the biggest public Wi-Fi networks in Italy, uh, run by the, they are state-funded, these ones, and the Wi-Fi is free. Or sometimes there are private companies funding it. Uh, I've been OpenWISP core developer since 2012, because OpenWISP is used by Cineca to manage these uh, huge public Wi-Fi networks. And then I've been working on NetJSON, uh, which some of you may know, it's a specification for a data interchange format for networking software. Next slide. So let's let's go ahead and talk about what's what's OpenWISP. OpenWISP is an open source network management system. It was started as a solution to manage public Wi-Fi, but it evolved into something that can manage different uh, type of networks. It aims to make it easier for people, organizations, companies to uh, manage and deploy their networks and one of the mm, very good advantages is that um, it helps to keep the cost low. So next slide. How do we... Next slide. Can you hear me? Yep, we're headed there. Okay, great. Uh, so how do we keep the cost low? Uh, it's because uh, it allows to automate repetitive actions Oh, I'm running out of battery, sorry. I did it. I forgot to connect the electricity. Anyway, uh, it because uh, automates repetitive actions, so um, you need less time, and your human resources will need less time to do things because uh, many of the boring stuff is automated. And it fully supports OpenWRT. So in this slide, there, there are links uh, which are put there. So later you can look at some of these links if you don't have don't know some of these links. Uh, OpenWRT is great because it runs on a lot of hardware and it runs also on very cheap hardware. And that's one of the reasons why OpenWISP is becoming so used in, in emerging in countries because they get this cheap hardware and then they need a solution to manage it. But if you want uh, a more expensive, uh, more full, fully featured controller, you need to look at Cisco or other solutions, which are a lot more expensive, not only in terms of licensing, but also in terms of the hardware that you buy. It's a lot more expensive. So OpenWISP, of course, is open, open source. It doesn't have licensing fees. And there's no vendor lock-in. We aim to support as many hardware, as, uh, as much hardware and as many systems as we can. Next slide. Uh, so another, before we jump to, to, I jump to show you some screenshots and some of the features, I, I want to underline some very important features uh, on the technical side for, for those of you who are more technical. Uh, OpenWISP is really modular, is composed of different modules that can be used independently or together. It provides a default 
default installation that uh, there's a uh, let's call it a script that installs the system which is quite complex so it's not for everyone uh, yet but uh, if if anybody is a developer or has experience installing open source software it should be fairly easy uh, the, the script installs this um, default installation which basically uses all these modules it, it is programmable and hackable so uh, it means that it's developer friendly developers yes. can extend yeah. it at their own functionality yeah. there's some somebody who is talking in the mind here they have can you can you turn off the microphone anyway okay go ahead thank you so go ahead. Go ahead. Oh. Oh, thank you. Uh, so it's written in Python, which is very important because the old version of OpenWisp was written in Ruby, which was not very popular back then. And can you hear me now? 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 Can you can somebody turn it off for, for them? Maybe they're not listening. Can you help us? Can you say? Go ahead, Federico. I'm trying to. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, Python is really important because that means that the project is uh, attracting new contributors because uh, many of the old uh, solutions that were built b before in the previous years are built in languages that not many developers use nowadays, so they are slowly uh, becoming harder to, to evolve. Uh, it has an active and growing community and is becoming popular in emerging countries, as I said. Okay, let's go ahead and now I can show you what OpenWisp can do. You can go ahead again, yeah. So there's uh, one of the features which is um, helps to keep the cost low is this auto-registration feature. There's a video link there. Uh, there's no time now. You can see this uh, if you're interested on YouTube uh, later. So uh, what it what it does is basically we can compile a default firmware image which uh, you just need to connect to the internet and it will uh, auto register into the system and you can prepare some default configuration called templates uh, which can be also differentiated by the type of uh, firmware image that you do you could do a mesh image you could do a public Wi-Fi image and all these images which uh, will automatically register and download the default configuration which is available in the controller uh, and they will auto configure itself uh, you you have uh, also the advantage that by keeping the configuration in the in the controller in openwisp you can update it anytime and uh, they all the devices will um, when you update a template all the devices that use that template will uh, update themselves so next slide this is how it looks uh, when the device registers, uh, except that the name is set. When the device registers, you will see the MAC address as the name. There is some information about the IP, the management IP, which uh, is used by OpenWISP to reach, if necessary, uh, the device. There are some other information. Next slide. And here you can see uh, this, for example, backend. That's really important because uh, with this solution, uh, we we are able to provide support for multiple operating systems. Even though now we only fully support for production usage, OpenWRT, but later I will tell you something more about this. Then you see templates that are all the templates that are uh, enabled on the device. Go, go ahead. And there's also the device as its own configuration that you can tweak if you need to do some local customization. Here you can see the uh, bridge interface, for example, and some other description. Go ahead. One of uh, the, the very important features of OpenWisp is its advanced mode in which you can edit the configuration directly in NetJSON format. This is very important because if the UI doesn't allow you to configure a package because of course we cannot support all the possible configurations with our limited resources in the UI but we can allow you to 
uh, write the configuration in a format that is then converted to the format that will be used on OpenWRT. This means, this is very powerful because it means that OpenWIS can configure any package supported by OpenWRT, so it, it is a network automation tool for any software that runs on OpenWRT. And in fact, it's being used for many things, not just uh, networking, mesh networks, but also some people are using it for SD-WAN now. And this is something that we didn't foresee coming, but it is happening, so uh, the, that's why I underlined this feature. This is not the only way to um, to configure additional packages. There are, there are also other ways that make it more easier for, for users, but there's no time to talk about that now. But you need to know that it is possible to have support for other packages. Yes, let's go ahead. So here you see different colors because it's an instance for a, for a private company that wanted a white label, so that's why it's blue. Uh, and here we have some, uh, well, the VPN uh, automation feature. This is also uh, another nice thing. It is possible to have the system automatically create VPN clients and create uh, SSL certificates. Well, I call it SSL, it's basically X509 certificates. Um, automatically for, for clients uh, which can be revoked if, if needed. So this is also a very nice automation that makes it easier to connect um, clients so devices can get their own VPN or multiple VPNs. So you can have a management VPN, you can have a traffic VPN if you want to tunnel the traffic to some other place and so on. Let's go ahead. So. Uh, let me open here the same slides on my screen so I see better. So yes, uh, this is the geographic map, um, nothing very interesting here, uh, but you can go to the next slide, which is something inter more interesting probably that mm, not many other open source software projects have. Uh, we added the possibility to place uh, the device on an indoor map. Uh, this is also very useful. Uh, for, for people that manage a lot of uh, access point and devices in buildings and nothing else to add. There's a, there's a possibility to to specify the floor, so if you have multiple floors. And in the future, we, we will b build a general map with all the devices, uh, both outdoor and indoor, but right now you can only see the single device on the on the indoor map. Okay, we can go ahead now. And another very important feature, feature especially for mesh networks and community networks which use uh, mesh routing protocols, is the network topology collector and visualizer. So we have this module which collects data from multiple nodes and is able to draw the graph uh, and show it. it. It is also possible, uh, in the next slide, we can see that it is possible to uh, go back in time and see uh, how was the network at the previous day. So we have daily snapshots which are collected uh, automatically daily and you can see there uh, that on the 11th of September of this year two links were down but instead in the previous slide uh, all the network was up. So it's, it's really, yes, it's really useful to keep track of what happens in the network and with, with the new feature coming next, we will also be able to do a lot of more automation regarding monitoring of, of these links. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can go ahead. Uh, another important module, especially for ISP and, and public Wi-Fi, it's the free radius module. Uh, I, I added the logo there just to <laughs> show, uh, but it's not there in the web interface. Uh, let's go ahead. Uh, here, just a few screenshots. Uh, if anybody is familiar with Radius, um, this module basically allows you to configure uh, and manage the free Radius database so you can define the group checks, the traffic limit for each profile, and things like that. Uh, we can go ahead. And here, another screenshot in which uh, we show accounting data, which this is very used uh, in ISPs to monitor how much traffic uh, each device is, is uh, consuming or uh, how much traffic a public Wi-Fi user is consuming and if he's reached the limit or not, the free radius accounting feature. So 
the new free radius module provide all these features for free radius and then we have also more stuff coming in the next slides we can see some previews and some mockups these features are not released yet uh, some of them are just mockups some of some of these uh, um, images are actually some code running not perfectly but uh, we will get there so very important tool for who manage network is uh, being able to see how the network is performing how much traffic is being consumed and so on so we can go ahead uh, the round trip time you can see there uh, and packet loss uh, and this system is also extensible it's designed in a way that it is possible to write new Python classes to write more checks so it's really powerful but it's not there yet we will release it probably in, uh, in the mid of 2019 hopefully uh, next slide you can see it will be also possible to see uh, not only graphs but also the current status of the device in a fixed let's say um, I don't know next slide is, 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 is good so you you also have a table which tells you how much memory is left on the device the load average and things like that and also it will be possible to see the Wi-Fi the channel the DBMs uh, information dynamic information about Wi-Fi which is refreshed about every five minutes or every minute that's configurable so it will be quite fresh next slide and and this is this is a I would say it's a prototype it's not there yet uh, less than the monitoring uh, but we aim to get there so we we are building a firmware upgrade module which will allow in the next slide you can see uh, that it's possible to upload firmware images and we plan to offer an automated way to upload firmware images into the system after, after compilation and in the next slide you can see that you can uh, click you can select a build and then you can tell the system to upgrade all the devices that are related to that firmware automatically so we, we are building basically a mass firmware upgrade feature but it will also allow to upgrade single devices so uh, experimental features that are coming in the future uh, these two actually we have implemented them last year but uh, the result is not production ready yet so we have uh, developed a, a ubiquity iOS configuration backend which allows from the same system that you have seen to configure uh, the native ubiquity iOS uh, firmware that's important because many communities prefer to not alter the firmware of the antennas for different reasons so so it will be important to land this feature in, in open with for communities but also for uh, wireless internet service providers then there's uh, Raspberry which is already supported with uh, OpenWRT and uh, you can install OpenWRT on Raspberry and you can um, manage it but we also plan to support the native firmware of, of the Raspberry which is also very used in other um, IoT or type of networks so uh, here I'm getting to the to the end of my presentation I try to keep it very brief I try to condense a lot of information but there's there's a lot more that we are doing the community is growing many different organizations uh, volunteers uh, Google coding students a lot of young people from all over the world lots of people from India lots of students from India that they want to learn to do this stuff they, they have fun enjoying programming but they also want to learn uh, programming for networks which is which is something which I think is really important to spread because it's not so common to find people who can code but also understand networks nowadays it's very easy to find people who uh, do web stuff uh, JavaScript but it's not easy to find people who can do JavaScript, web, Python, and networking. And if we don't train these people to build these tools, we will not be able to compete with the big companies which have a lot of money and are able to build these uh, systems, uh, network controllers, which aim to lock you in. And once you're locked in and you have all their hardware, they basically control you and we don't want that we don't want that because they can increase cost anytime they can put licensing on the controllers 
and we don't want that. So if you if you think this is important for your organization, uh, let's join forces, uh, come and talk to me, um, because there's a lot of activity and we're working on many things and with the help of all these students and volunteers that are helping us fixing a lot of problems and also building a lot of features uh, for, for the and this is all done to help the the communities in the world that are not connected for different reasons of course is but I think it's not only ISPs it is also because managing these networks is not easy it's not easy they fail they they break they get hacked because the firmware is not upgraded uh, sometimes some communities ask their participants to participate but it's really hard uh, sometimes it seems like you need a degree to to uh, an engineering degree to do some of the things we have to make it easier if we want people to really build their their own networks because otherwise it's really hard I've done this I've done this many times I helped to build many nodes here in Italy networks nodes and, and I see the common people that have this node in their houses, they struggle to log in into the, the antenna configuration and see all this, this information. We ask them to upgrade their firmware, but it's, it's hard for them. So we need to provide tools. There's a lot of communities, uh, LibreMesh and other communities, uh, which are building these kind of things. Uh, OpenWisp is another tool that focuses on, on building a control panel. Uh, that's what it is. So, thank you very much. The last slide, you can see the OpenWisp logo <laughs> and you can see the link to the website openwisp.org if you want to find more information and, and my presentation ends here. Thank you very much and if you have any question here or, or later online, you can find me on Twitter. I'm very active there. Uh, you, you can find me on the mailing list of the several projects I participate, so it's really easy to reach me if you want. Thank you, Federico. Um, we have run out of time in the room, and I'm cognizant of the fact that we maybe get kicked out. But what I may suggest, uh, Federico, is we're going to take the um, Leandro's presentation into an online Gaia, and we may see if people have questions for you. Is that okay with you? Yeah, sure. Okay, great. Um, so thank you very much, Federico. This was an excellent presentation. Uh, it speaks to the heart of some of the tech work that's going on in community networks. We thank everyone for your attention, and um, sorry we ran out of time. This was the first time that we've done 99% of the work online, so um, thank you to everyone that was um, hugely aware of that and synced up with us uh, remotely. So this was uh, kind of a big ask. Thank you very much, and stay tuned. Gaia, we're putting a draft outline together that we hope to hack with you at the next meeting in Prague, but you'll see us on the net where we are going to be running this all by you. So thank you again, and we appreciate you coming, and thanks so much to the presenters who are online with us. Um, we're going to sign off and um, see you on the net. Thanks a lot.